Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, it is good to see so many of you out today. Please excuse the tardiness of our delay. We were trying to help a few folks there get connected that were having some connection issues. But again, uh, we are grateful for our leadership, President U, uh, Ruth Johnson and all of hers who lead our wonderful Congress of Christian Education. Uh, this morning, we are blessed and favored by God to have one of the Lord's favorite sons uh, with us today. Uh, this class, class is titled Preparing to Teach Sunday School or Bible Study. Its intended purpose uh, is to be a blessing and a benefit to those people who are maybe uh, either just now entering uh, the realms of teaching Sunday school or Bible study, or have some degree uh, of interest to do that. Uh, our guest today uh, is not truly a guest because uh, he is one of ours, affectionately. Uh, the Reverend, he will, well, no, the Reverend Quan Stewart. I was going to say Reverend Doctor, but his doctor would be in education. Uh, I'm not going to belabor our time anymore, but he is a native of Bennisville, South Carolina. Uh, he holds several degrees, one in political science and psychology. He oh, has a master's degree uh, in theology. He has a master's uh, in education, is now currently working on his PhD. Uh, he is the very new and very fine pastor. Uh, and I am going to say, uh, get out of his way and allow him to lead us on this morning as the Lord leads his heart. Reverend Stewart, the course is in your hand. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I pray that this will be a wonderful experience for you as we go together to lead and to study to God's word and study how to be better at what we do as teach Christian educators. If you would join me in prayer before we get started. Father, we thank you for this time together and thank you for who you are to us. Thank you for your kindness, for your generosity of another day's journey and this opportunity in virtual space to connect one with another, even on this snowy North Carolina morning. We thank you for what you're doing. We pray now, Father, as we go forth to study thy word, as we study and prepare ourselves for thy word, we pray that you'll be with us. Let us be one with thee, that we can be able to serve this present age and do the work you've called for us to do. It is the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray, amen. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started uh, with our lesson today. Uh, give me a moment to get everything up and running. All right, so I'll do that. Share screen. All right. So I am sharing my screen. You should see my presentation. Does is everyone able to see my presentation? I don't think you can see that. Give me a second. Yes. Yes, Reverend Stewart, we can see it. Yes. We can see it. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes. All right. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, um, our pre our, our study today is preparing to teach Bible study in Sunday school. And uh, this presentation, uh, parts of this presentation will be available for you um, after our study uh, time today. Uh, as we go forth, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat log. I'll stop at various points of our study today to check for understanding and see where we are and if we have any questions. So first thing I wanna do is I wanna go over what our objectives are. Our first objective is to recognize the personality of the student and their social aims to understand the concepts of lesson preparation, to develop a framework for understanding instruction, and to hopefully be able to create an instructional plan. Uh, you will notice, and we'll talk about this a little bit in detail, that every time I teach, I start out with an objective. Um, and that is so that we can frame our mind around what we're teaching. Uh, many times, whether it's Bible study or Sunday school, we just dive right into the lesson without preparing the students for what we're getting ready to teach. Um, Eugene Lowry wrote in the homiletical plot that when, when the congregants come to hear a sermon on Sunday morning, they're not thinking about the message that you're thinking about. 
they're not prepared for what you're about to present, even if you are to print the, the title on a page, on, on, on the title of the sermon on, on, the, pro, on the program. Same thing is with our classrooms. When people come into our classrooms, even though most of them have um, the Bible study handout that you provided, or if it's Sunday school, they have the, um, hand, the, the, the teaching material, the, the, the textbook, but some of them haven't even read for the week. They haven't prepared. So they're not quite sure what you're going to present to them. So by presenting the lesson objectives first, it frames the, frames the thinking process for the learner and it shapes it for you as the teacher so that you are clear about what you're teaching. Um, and we'll get a little bit more in detail with this in just a moment. So I wanna first start with who am I teaching? We are teaching no longer just teaching one set of students. Um, and we're teaching a multi-generational church. We have grandma, great-grandma, grandpa, great-grandpa, uh, aunts, uncles, cousins, and then we have everything down to the little babies. So when we're teaching, we have to be aware of who we are teaching. And once we are, and that's important because it shapes how we teach and what we do in the instructional moment. Or a good example of this is trying to teach children today who currently go to school, school-aged children, they're not familiar with the sit and get idea that most of us were taught with when we were in school, which is the teacher stands in front of the classroom, talks for 30 minutes, ask a couple of questions, you jump in with your comments. They're not used to that. What they're used to is chunked information, information that's been divided up, their time has been divided up, they're used to transitions, they're used to activities and doing things. So if we're expecting them to sit for 30 minutes, that's not gonna work. That's why we have a lot of kids that have, that can't, and it's, and it's not ADHD all the time. It's just, they're not used to sitting in a seat for 30 minutes. They're used to getting up, moving around the room, doing some other activities. So we have to be aware of that as we are engaging students in the learning process. So I wanna go into what uh, Eric Erickson, um, labeled as the psychosocial stages of, of individuals. So these are the ways in which people at different ages think and process information. Um, we can think of this both as the physical development of an individual and the spiritual development of an individual because it's really the same ideas go in place. So what this is, is gonna help us see not generations, not you know boomer generation, um, Generation Z, Generation X, the silent generation. This is looking at those within age ranges. So when we look at children, those are in the age range of, of eight, 12 to 18. I really excluded everyone 11 and, lo and lower because that's a whole different discussion. Um, and for the most part, we're looking at people in these age ranges. Um, these are students who are looking to identify who they are. They are still in that process of understanding who they are. So they're questioning, who am I? And it's at this age that they, um, they, they, they get a, what we call fidelity, an understanding of a faithful viewpoint that they are, this is what they're going to believe for the rest of their life. They're ready to be faithful to an ideological viewpoint. So this means that at this age, they're trying to shape who they are, what they believe, what they think, who they're going to be. And at this age, they're starting to shape their faith understanding. So if you're teaching... Um, kids in this is probably middle school to high school age range students, your real focus in teaching should be helping them understanding the faith itself, because this is the age range where they're, uh, they're going to make the, the, the real decision of, am I going to accept Christ as my savior or not? Am I going to believe what I've been taught? And we've got to remember they're dealing with multiple ideologies, multiple ways of thinking. There, it's not just Christianity coming at them. There, there's um, there's uh, atheism out there. There's other faith religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, um, Islam that's coming at them. So it's at this age range that you're really going to have to focus on helping them to understand the faith of Jesus, uh, of Christianity, helping them understand who they are in Christ, how Christ shapes them to be who they are, and how to navigate this world. When we go to the next age range, which is 18 to 24, this age range is 
this is the one that we start to see uh, are the evaporating out of our congregation, uh, these young adults. We don't see a lot of these young adults. They are looking at what we call intimacy versus isolation. This is the idea of they love to work and they love to love. So what they're looking to do at this age range is they're looking for love. They're looking to transform the love that they received as a child into being able to becoming and caring for other people. So as we're teaching young adults, they're, they're, they're looking for a, a social group. They're looking, when they come to church, they're going to come to church by themselves. They're coming to church with a friend or two. They're coming to, their, coming to Sunday school. They're coming to Bible study with people they know. And it's even in, you'll see this in the 18 to 12 range as well. You'll see them texting one another, asking, are you going to church tonight? Are you going to Bible study this week? Are you going to vacation Bible school? And if their friend's not going, they're not going. So that's where we have to create a culture and an environment in our Sunday schools, in our Bible studies, um, in any of our teaching set sessions that this age group can get together and enjoy themselves. And they also love to work which means that church in this modern age puts them at a very challenging state. They have to choose between going to work or going to church. And we've seen currently in our churches who usually wins out, going to work usually wins. So that means we have to create something at the church to make them want to stay. There's a book called The Sticky Church. And one of the things it mentions in, the, in that book is that our churches have a back, our back door is a revolving door that people come in the front door just to cycle back out the back door. And that's because we haven't created an environment that makes it sticky for them to want to stay. So this idea of 18 to 14 year olds, um, 18 to 24 year olds, they love to love. So this may be something as you're teaching them, you're one of looking at teaching them how to transform love that they have for them, their hearts to loving other people. And one of the key questions they're always asking is, how do you love people who don't love you back? How do you treat people who mistreat you? That's one of the heavier questions because that, in this age range, that's what they're seeking to understand. We also have the 25 to 65 age. Now, I know this is a, a long uh, span of time in terms of age ranges, um, but what this age range seeks to understand is this age range is focused on um, on being productive and creative in life. They want to care for other people. They have a need to be needed. So this, what we call this late young adult stage to middle age stage, they, this is the group that's always looking to do something. Um, a good example of this was, is during uh, Hurricane Florence, when it came through. Prior to that, we didn't see a lot of young adults in, in, in the church. They were there in, in the church I pastored at the time. Uh, they were present at the time. They came in every other Sunday or so. But whenever we start doing things, such as passing out goods for the, um, for the, to the poor, or whether we're helping out during Hurricane Flor um, Florence or doing hurricane relief efforts, they showed up in large numbers. When we start doing stuff for the nursing homes and want to do care bags, they showed up in tremendous numbers just to put the care bags together and go to the nursing home. They're looking to do something. They're looking to be actively engaged. And so that means in the Sunday school session, you're going to have to really think about how do I take the lesson to talk about active engagement, about not just talking about the principles of who the disciples were, but how do I now turn the lesson on understanding the 12 disciples into becoming a disciple myself? What does that look like? And then finally, we have the age range of 64 plus. And that should say 65 plus, excuse me. Um, this is the age range that looks at integrity versus despair. They're looking at life from a different angle. They're looking at life experiences, what they've been through, what they've done in life. And they want to talk about how do I share that, that my life experiences with someone else. Now, this age group is if you think about your Sunday school, no matter what you're talking about, they're always talking about what they used to do. When I was growing up, this is what we used to do. When I, was doing, when I was in school, we didn't have to brag um, ask kids to come to Sunday school because my parents made us go to Sunday school, but we need to make our children come to Sunday school. Uh, or when I was in uh, school, this is how we behave. Or, and this is that, that's that age group that's always talking about yesterday. 
And, but what they're really seeking to do is they're seeking to take their knowledge and advance it in the life of another generation. So they're always willing to pass on that knowledge, what they know and their experiences onto another generation. So that's why if you're looking at your classroom setups, and I'm hoping that this is gonna lead you to start to think about how you're dividing up your classes, um, you really should consider, should I really be putting um, 18 year olds in the adult Sunday school class? Because I'll be honest, as a 36 year old, it drives me bananas to sit in Sunday school and I'm hearing you keep talking about yesterday. Yesterday, we used to do this. This is how we used to do it in school. Okay, that's great, but that's not, that's not reaching me. I'm a part of that age group that's looking to be needed. So I'm looking to do something. So we should really consider as we're looking at who we're teaching, how we're we going to approach the division of our Sunday school classes, how are we going to approach um, what we're teaching and how we're gonna get an outcome, the application thereof of the lesson. The application as you see will be much different as you look at different age ranges. I'm not gonna ask a, a person in their seventies to go out and um, shovel snow in a driveway. But I might ask them, could you give me some ideas of how I can engage young adults to do the effort of going out shoveling snow? And asking young adults to look at what is the spiritual aspect of going out and being kind and courteous, shoveling someone's driveway or cutting someone's grass, asking them to be engaged. Um, and then with the 12, 18 year old looking on, they're starting to now get an understanding of what this faith looks like. So as you see, at once you understand who you're teaching, it really transforms how you teach. It really transforms what you do and what you say and how you get in them involved. That's right, um, Brother Steve. Train them up the way they should go. When they are old, they won't depart from it. And as you see, they won't depart from it because based upon what they're learning, based upon how they are engaging. Um, very good question, um, Brother Porter, about looking at different genders. Uh, genders makes a, is a difference as well. Um, having different classes for men and women, because um, I'll be honest, I, I know there are some men who will not speak up in the Sunday school class with women, simply because they don't read well, they don't talk, their subject and verbs don't agree, and they don't want to feel less than in front of a woman. So they will speak in a group of men way before they speak in front of a group of women. Women will have a conversation that they don't want men to be on, you know, not because they're trying to keep men out of it, but because there's just something personable in a way that a man would never understand, that another sister would. So as you're looking at your classes, that's something you can focus on. Um, how do we have our classes divided, divided by gender? How do we have our classes divided by, um, by age ranges and things like that nature? Um, are there any other questions while I'm on this slide about who we are teaching? If you have a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, ask a question, or you can type it into the chat box. Hearing no questions um, and seeing no other questions. What you'll notice is I'm what I'm doing as I'm teaching is I'm also modeling for you what you should do in a teaching moment. Um, sometimes one of the things I, I've learned in teaching is sometimes the teacher can talk way too much. Have you ever sat in a class where you just wanted to say something but the teacher just wouldn't stop talking? The class is not the class is not about the teacher. It's about the learners. So one of the matrix uh, things I like to do is I like to put on a timer. If you keep look, seeing me look down, I'm looking at my phone to look at my timer. I like to talk for seven minutes and then stop for five. Talk for seven, stop for five. That's because what I want is for to be sure that people have the opportunity to engage. Um, so that's one thing that I want you to be aware of. Be aware of how long you're talking. And then what you're going to notice as we go through, I'm going to ask questions. So in case I do stop and there are no questions, I'm going to ask a question to generate conversation as well. Uh, Brother Porter, I do see your comment about it wasn't acceptable. That's uh, separating by um, gender is a challenge. And uh, from the first church I pastored, once I did do it by age rank, by um, genders, the first couple of weeks, they didn't like it. Um, even when I posed the idea, they didn't like it. Um, but after about a month of it, we was trying to go back together and they did not want to get back together. 
they really start to enjoy being around each other. And that's because you are proposing something that's new, that's uncomfortable. And there's a lot of history that was behind these classes being joined together. And they like to hear other people's conversations. So it, that, that work takes some time to get to. But thank you for asking that question. All right, so let's keep going. So we talked about who we're teaching. Let's now talk about how do we teach? How do I go from taking the lesson that I have, whether it is the Bible study lesson or the Sunday school lesson, and um, engage them in a teaching moment? And this is going to uh, answer the question, um, Joy Long, you're asking about the best way to engage um, engage youth, younger people as we are virtual. We're going to talk about that as well in this moment, in this second. So, and so one of the key pieces of this is no matter what you're using to do your instruction, whether it is the Sunday school lesson, regardless of what you're using as your curriculum um, base, whether it is uh, a Sunday school textbook or Bibles, you're doing a book study, whatever study method you're using, you, our job as teachers is to unpack the lesson, to take the time to go through what the teacher is expected to teach and what the learner is expected to learn. Um, and I'm hoping that our lesson today is going to shape the way you're thinking about your lesson, even if you're preparing to teach tomorrow, that you're just going to take you to reshape and think about how you're going to apply tomorrow's lesson. So let's look at how do we unpack the lesson? The first thing is you have to do your homework, going through doing a historical background analysis of what you're teaching. Um, tomorrow's lesson, I know if you're using Union Press, Gospel Press, you're talking about the direct, Jesus's arrest and betrayal by Judas Iscariot. If you're using um, H.R. Boyd, your lesson is on justice and um, justice and adversity coming out of Deuteronomy. You need to do a background analysis on, number one, the book. What book am I studying? If I'm studying Deuteronomy or if I'm studying the book of John, I need to understand who this writer is. Why did they write? Why did this, was this book put together? Understand the historical nature of the time in which the lesson is taking place. We need to understand some of the language that's used. The reason why, uh, can someone tell me why would I say we need to understand the historical background of the lesson? Should be able to unmute yourself. Go ahead. If you would, if you're unmuting yourself, let us know your name and what church you're from. Hi, so, this is Carol Howie. Uh, I'm from Greater Providence Baptist Church. Um, and one thing that I've learned in our classes when we're talking about the historical background, it kind of gives us an idea of what was happening at that time and the events that are shaping what we are reading about. And what I really like is we also kind of tie it into our lives and what's going on today. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Sister Howe. That's exactly what we're looking for. That idea of understanding what happened then and then how does it tie into now? Because it shapes what you're seeing. It shapes what you're reading. It shapes your understanding of the lesson. And some of our Sunday school curriculum, I looked at, um, at R.H. Boyd and I looked at Union Press, they mix the historical background into the exposition. So you have to read through it and pull it out. But I would encourage teachers before you start teaching that you, during your study that week, you go ahead and pull out the historical background. You snatch it out the lesson so that it becomes a part of the initial conversation you're having as you're doing your instruction. Because you want to frame the mind of the thinker, you want to um, get them in the place of feeling what those people at that time felt. So, if we're talking about um, the betrayal of Jesus by Judas Iscariot tomorrow, we want to get people in the mind of thinking: What was Judas actually thinking in that moment? What was Jesus feeling in that moment? What it must have been like to be one of the soldiers who was going to arrest Jesus? What it must have been like to be a disciple to now see your savior, your 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 master for three years, getting ready to be charged, and he did nothing wrong. And then now you can tie it to today's lesson of time of life when we're looking at justice and adversity, um, ad ad adversity, the fact that we're having, we're seeing black men 
Black Lives Matter being shot on the streets, doing nothing wrong, being charged with chucked up charges, doing nothing wrong. And how do we respond to this, this moment of crisis in our nation? How do we respond to this, this moment of crisis in our cities and in our towns? So um, the historical background is vitally important because it gives you much more ground to stand on as you're teaching. The next thing is the theological principle. Everything has that we're teaching points to some kind of theological principle, some kind of theological understanding. Um, I would encourage you to take the time to understand what that doctrinal theological point is because we are moved today by all kinds of wind and doctrine, different ideas and ideologies. And if we're going to be the church Jesus called us to be, we need to know what we know about Jesus Christ. How does this point us to understand who God is? What does this lesson on adversity share about the justice of God? How the justice of God moves and it functions? What does this lesson on betrayal teach us about the, the will of God? And the, and the work of God. So that's, that background principle is needed to be understood. We also need to understand what the unit objective is. Um, each of your, every month, your lesson goes to, it changes to a different unit. Uh, this unit um, in HR board again is justice and, um, justice and adversity. For Union Gospel Press, it is triumph over trials. Um, so this idea of, and, and here's another big nugget behind this, this, the, all Sunday schools work on um, curriculum or points to some international Sunday school curriculum outline. So they're all working together through some international outline for, through the uh, International Council of Churches to point to the same thing so that every Sunday school lesson around the nation and around the world is talking about the same thing. So everyone who's teaching Sunday school is in some way or shape or form talking about justice and talking about adversity, talking about um, trials and triumphing over those trials, um, justice and mercy, those kind of things. So take the time to understand how this lesson pulls into the unit objective. Um, this will be a good thing to do to, with, to develop your unit, and we'll talk about unit objectives and pulling the, the unit study together in just a moment. Um, but doing the unit piece together will be a great idea to do maybe at the start of each month or before the next, next unit get together with all your teachers and work together on the unit um, plan so that you know all of you are learning together what this unit is about and what our goals will be for this unit so that what every student understands at the end of this unit, the same thing. And now again, because we're talking about different age ranges, they're gonna understand it in different ways about either caring or wisdom or fidelity or, um, or, or, or working, but we're all learning the same idea, the same concept. So learn that unit objective, then you have your lesson objective, your lesson divisions, but, and then most importantly, when this lesson is over, what do you want people to do? Your, your lesson should have some application, some initiating faith response piece that when this lesson is over, they should do something with it. Whether it's Sunday school or Bible study, you should leave out with a charge that says, this is what we're going to do with this letter. This is how this lesson looks in practice in the modern world. This is what this lesson on justice looked like in the time of Deuteronomy, but this is what justice looks like in our modern world. So what we really wanna focus on as we unpack the lesson are these key critical areas. And here's what can help us do that. I have created, and you'll get access to this, um, some cheat sheets that's going to help you develop your unit outline and your lesson outline. Here is, I'm trying to make sure that the screen went where I want it to go. So give me a second. I might have to reshare my screen. Uh, do you see um, this unit cheat sheet here? Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah. Okay, awesome. yeah. So um, what this shows you is what I've done is for those who use Union Gospel Press, I have gone ahead of you and created your unit outline. So your unit, which starts Sunday, 
uh, starts this Sunday, I've already done your unit outline for you. And what I've done is, what you do is, um, is you, as you're going through this, if you're going through the, the, um, the book, the curriculum book that you're using, and you're pulling out those lesson aims, you're pulling out those unit aims, and you're putting it in a document, because what I want to do is start to frame for your thinking, this is what I'm talking about. And this will help you when you have uh, Deacon so-and-so who pulls your lesson off track. All of us got at least one member of our church. I love, we love all our members, but we all know that one member who's going to talk about something totally irrelevant. Amen. Nowhere near what the lesson's about. But when you talk, when you have already listed out what the lesson objectives are and you yourself are clear on them, it is easier for you to pull that lesson back on track. So having this framework is going to help clear your mind of what this will be. The whole unit objective. So this, this is listing all the unit objectives for all five Sundays that, of this unit on triumph over trials. This unit focuses on the passion of Jesus Christ and the events ultimately, um, the events leading immediately after the resurrection. And I forgot to put in here that it ties into understanding um, the justice and mercy and work of God. Uh, I've listed here all of the objectives. It's listed here for you. So I now know what I am planning to have the outcome of this lesson. I want to start with noticing as you're looking at your objectives, both learning objectives and unit objectives and lesson objectives, notice, always notice the first word the verb of the sentence. This is telling you what we are expecting people to do, the students to do with this lesson. We want them to know that Jesus was never guilty of sin. We want them to recognize that Jesus was willing to bear, abhor, bear our sins. We want them to examine how Christ is tried by these high priests. We want them to recognize Christ's faithfulness in this situation. And for them to be clear, he was tried by Roman authorities to fulfill the prophecy. We want them to recognize Jesus as king of divine origin. So you're seeing this is what we want them to do. This is, and so this means how do, this is the activity, the action that we should be getting towards, that we should be teaching towards this verb, this activity. So that in other words, when this lesson is over, I want them to be able to know John's account of Jesus and how it differs from the other accounts, if it differs at all. I'm gonna leave that out there for you to consider. For them to be wholly assured that Jesus died on the cross to take away their sins. For them to recognize that Jesus' resurrection was physical and guaranteed life to all who believe in him. This may seem trivial to an adult, but for kids, they need to know this was a physical activity, that Jesus just didn't, this is not some mystical thought process, that Jesus literally died, literally rose again. Just like we lay down and go to sleep and wake up the next morning, Jesus died and rose again. And he did this and guarantees this new life to all those who believe. So going through these lessons, going through this as a teacher, pulling these out will help shape this. And the other piece to this, um, is um, as you are working with your teachers, as you're working with people um, and you're teaching and you're designing your lesson plan, your unit plan, I would say this would be a great time as you're sitting down together with your Christian education department, your Sunday school or your Bible study team, sit down and help them understand this is what our objectives are. Now, what are some ways we can go about teaching this lesson? Um, if I was in um, public education, like I am, and we were doing this at, I was going over lesson planning with teachers, I would call this a professional learning community, or PLC. We're gonna get together as a professional learning community of Christian educators on Tuesday night and sit down and develop our unit objectives. And as we develop these unit objectives, we're gonna to talk together about ways we can teach this lesson and share ideas with one another about how we can help kids understand that Jesus died and rose on the third day, helping our adults to recognize that we should be faithful in all situations. How do I teach faithfulness to 
young adults and what faithfulness looks like. So that'll be a good idea and a good task to do together um, as, um, as a team. Um, the next thing is to develop the unit essential question, which is what is the one thing the, after this unit is over, all these lessons should have been are geared towards answering one question. So for this lesson, it would be, how do the trials, experiences, death, and resurrection of Jesus help us triumph over the trials we face in life? What do we gain from learning about this? This is the question the lesson is seeking to answer. Now, here's the thing. The essential question or the lesson, uh, lesson essential question is not going to be something you find in the lesson per se. Um, this may be something, a question that you will have to develop as a team or individually, if you're doing this as an individual, um, that will be the question, the overarching question that drives the unit instruction. And then finally, I'll list it down here, each lesson and the scripture focus for the month or for this unit. This may be something that uh, you could consider saying, hey, this might be a good handout to give to um, our students so that when they're studying and going home, they have now for them pulled out for them, just like it is for you, what this whole unit is about, what we're actually studying. And I know I'm saying Sunday school, this is even better for Bible study, because if you are creating your own Bible study, this would be very helpful for you so that you're not having to come up every Wednesday with some new idea. By sitting down and planning out what the entire month is gonna look like and how all these pieces tie together, it's gonna save you a lot of stress and a lot of time. So I would say work together. If, you, if you're talking about youth Bible study or adult Bible study classes, sit down together and develop a unit outline so that you know clearly this is what we are gonna talk about this month. And now I don't have to spend every Wednesday shuffling back and forth trying to pull together Bible study. If you are a pastor, take it from me. This is what I do every month or every series I get ready to do. I sit down and do a series outline that outlines what I want the students to learn, students to know, what scriptures I'm focusing on, that so that it keeps me focused. But then also, since I have a day job, when I leave school at four o'clock and I'm running down to the church to get ready for Bible study, I don't have to feel stressed because I already know what I'm teaching. And now I, all I have to do is sit down and center myself in preparing to teach. I'm going to pause here for questions. Are there any questions? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead. I have a question. This is Joyce Long from Mission Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, the question as far as um, Sunday school and mm -hmm. then one for Bible study. As far as Sunday school, when you have um, teachers that actually, um, when they're teaching, they just actually reading. They're just reading the lesson, and that that bothers me a little a little bit when you're not actually explaining the scriptures, but you're actually just reading. Okay, so that comes from um, that can be a multiplicity of things. It could be number one, you didn't prepare. I'm just gonna be blunt with that. But number mm -hmm. two, it could be I just don't. They just don't know how to teach. So that may be a good time to have a workshop with all of your teachers. And I'll be glad to come and help you do that to actually teach teachers how to teach because teaching is a difficult process um, mm -hmm. if you don't know what you're doing. It just looks intimidating. But how do I engage students, develop these questions, become familiar with the, the art form of teaching? Um, so that's what that is and how to stop and explain and when to stop and explain. That's a process that should be modeled and taught for them. Okay, thank you. And also with Bible study, when you say you you have your outline of what you're going to teach for Bible study, do you share that with your church on what we're going to be? You share the the topics with your um, congregation for each Bible yeah. study. When I do a series, I do start the first night of the series. I outline for them just the general topics. I don't go into the scriptures because I don't want them to get too far ahead of me on that because then they'll be doing, I don't want them to run that far and um, get that far in the meat, but I do outline for them, here are the general topics that we're covering. 
so that if you have questions, this is a good time to bring your and develop questions for that lesson. Uh, and then it's also a good time for them to say, hey, pastor, uh, while we're on this subject, could you include in the lesson this year? Because I've always had a question on that. So, all right. Yes, I do that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, any other questions? Reverend Stewart. Yes. Loretta Van from Calvary Missionary Baptist Church. Do you have a outline like this one that you're showing on your screen for the uh, board? I was working on one and board became very, uh, became a headache for me. So, but I'm working on one and I'll ho hopefully have one for you. Um, if not this evening, tomorrow, and I will get it to Dr. Barr and, and General Baptist so that they can share that information with you. But I'm working on one for board. Okay, thank you so, so much. You're welcome. And I'm glad you brought that question up because the way Boyd structures their curriculum package, theirs is embedded into it. Right. And you really have to dig through that thing and it's not clear. Um, so that's one of the one of the challenges that I have with Boyd. They don't make anything clear. No, no, you have to do a lot of more research for them before you teach. Exactly. Um, and that's one reason why I think this would be a good time for you to work with some other teachers in your um, in your school. And if you don't have any in your school, maybe another church and to help develop these outlines. And that could help you be able to relieve some of that stress of having to do all this extra homework and trying to pull all this stuff together because it is a lot to try to prepare to teach. Uh, Brother Neely, uh, you had a question? Yes, sir. Um, Adrian Neely of West Durham Baptist Church. Um, my question is, uh, when you're teaching, a, when you when you're teaching a class and the class seems to shut down and they're not really responsive, what techniques do you use to get them reengaged? You know, that can be tricky sometimes. And uh, very good question. So to get them engaged, so number one, the question is probably because they don't know the answer, or they're afraid of it. So that would be a good time to either number one reframe the question. Um, to ask the question in a different way, or give some examples of that, um, of that answer. Um, that may be a good way to do that as well. Um, UMI materials for Sunday school, any ideas? I will look at UMI. Um, that was one of those I did not look at. So I will look at UMI and get some ideas for you for UMI. Um, I hope that answers your question, Brother Neely. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, one, one other question. Um, if there's uh, every now and then, if you're teaching a class where it has ages from 18 to 65, what's your approach uh, with that, that mix? That's one of those classes that you're going to have to really do a lot of good work and try to um, craft the lesson and what we call it, if it was in school, we call it scaffolding, build the lesson to meet different ages. So maybe pre, um, pre um, develop some questions that you want to ask beforehand um, and be discriminated and say, hey, I need for those from 18 to 25 to answer this question, those from 35 to 90 to um, answer this question, because you know that, because again, you know somebody's gonna answer all the questions, but that would help to, 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 to uh, shrink down your, your answer group. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Good morning, Pastor Stewart and all attendees. Alicia Holloway, First Calvary Baptist Church. The question for you is how will we obtain these um, um, tools that you're providing for us? Do you have all of our email addresses? I will share that with Dr. Barr and we'll get that to you um, through some form of communication. Um, and then I'll, I'll show you another website at the end of the lesson today to show you how to access that material. Thank you so much. Also to that question, Reverend Stewart, I'll add real quick. Um, the replay of all of our classes will be available on the convention website, but there will also be a tab for resources, workshop resources, and you'll be able to go in there. We'll have the title to each class and any information that's shared from facilitators will also be hosted there on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Mm -hmm. um, so answer this last question, because I think our time is slowly wrapping up on us. Um, one church is walking through the Bible in Sunday school. So what are some tips for someone teaching by book for the, of the Bible? So this is, again, a good, this is a perfect time to use um, a unit outline because that will help keep the conversation, again, from being, because depending on what book you're in, it can go to a lot of different ways. 
So it helps to drive that question, drive that discussion and, and focus your discussion. Um, so if you're doing a book study um, or if you're doing a verse by verse study of that book, however you're approaching it, that unit development will help design that for you. And then since you're talking about new learners versus senior age learners or senior adult learners, again, consider um, the same process that if I'm a new learner, I'm excited and I want to go get everybody saved, but I have no information. So I need to be taught how do I do stuff and then taught how do I get information from a very um, elementary standpoint versus a senior who already has known this for years, but now needs to look at how do I apply it and teach other people. So I hope that answered that question as well. Um, as we conclude, um, I'm going to speed through this here. Um, this is the unit outline. I've also prepared for you a, um, I didn't mean to do that. Um, I also prepared for you um, a lesson cheat sheet as well. Um, so this will be um, similar to the unit outline, but again, this focuses on one specific lesson and it drives home for you. Again, the top is roughly the same information, but down here in the outline is focusing on those three main points that the lesson focuses on. And what I really want you to do, drill on on this point is, number one, the introduction. How do I pull you into the lesson to get you involved in the lesson? Um, so this lesson was on betrayal and I was asking the question of if you betrayed someone, why would you do that? How would you feel? That kind of thing. Um, and checking for understanding. How do I know people learn something? So that would be asking questions that are related to each point. Um, so I've laid out for you partly because I didn't want to do the full lesson for you. Um, some good points about, um, about this lesson. I think our time is slowly coming to an end. Give me a second. Let me see my read my time carefully. Um, so our time is slowly coming to a conclusion. Um, so I'm gonna pause again to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, again, the idea of this lesson, of this, of this study was how do I prepare you? How do we prepare ourselves to teach tomorrow morning? How do we prepare ourselves to teach Wednesday or Tuesday night? It's this idea of framing the idea, framing the way you think, framing the discussion. Um, in a way that engages people. Um, my green screen is falling. Uh, <laughs> um, so framing the idea, give me a second because Dr. Barr knows that is going to bother me as I continue to teach. So give me a second. I'm going to mirror my screen. There we go. Take the green screen off, mirror my screen. There we go. All right. So that won't bother me as much as it is. Um, so it's really about shaping your mind, shaping the way you think. Um, and then here's the other thing I want you to notice I'm doing. Um, then um, it is, notice I keep re summarizing each segment. I stop as I'm teaching, as I, as I answer a question or I move on, I stop and I re-answer those questions or, or summarize that section again. The reason why is in people's mind, they're trying to bring themselves to a conclusion. And by restating that statement or restating that section, it helps put a button on that sleeve. And so they can move on to the next point without feeling as if you just left them out there. So always try to summarize each point as you move on and then try to summarize the end of your lesson. Um, so um, are there any, uh, uh, so how do you get my contact? Um, here, it, this will also be in the presentation that will be shared with you, uh, but I will share it with you here as well. Um, is it? Yes. So if you need to get in contact with me, uh, you can reach me at steward at ministryconsultingfirm.org. Um, and these resources will also be available there and on the convention website. Um, I did notice a technical error um, and something on the webs on my ministry consulting firm website. So I will get that fixed and get that to you. 
got the ones that you can use, I'll give you to Dr. Barr. You can go ahead and prepare your lessons. But if there's any way I can help you, if your church needs someone to come and assist you in teaching lessons, to learn to teach, um, do a workshop for you, feel free to contact me and I'll be glad to come out to help you in doing that or whatever you need in terms of preparing to teach. Dr. Barr is in your hands. Reverend Stewart, uh, wonderful presentation, wonderful information, excellent in your delivery. Uh, this has been time well spent. Um, I think that for this initial class, we've had a lot of requests <clears throat> that we share along these lines to really help train the teachers. Uh, and we know that's a lifelong process. So thank you for committing to come out today. Thank you for supporting the Congress of Christian Education uh, that we might continue that which the Lord told us to do, which is to learn of him. Uh, I wanna thank Reverend Stewart again uh, for coming this morning. Uh, he, he did not hesitate when we asked and we just couldn't think of a better person to facilitate this conversation. I do highly recommend uh, you connecting with him and allowing him to come and connect with your churches. Uh, one of the things that I love about Reverend Stewart is his attention to detail. And one thing I can assure you of, if he comes to your church, he's not going to bring you a carbon copy anything. He's going to sit down with you and customize a plan for you and for your learning process. I think this is a great time as we're coming through and out of COVID. I don't think there's any better time to really evaluate um, your processes, the way you do the things that you do in particular as it relates to our teaching ministries. We're in a time of, of plenteous of information, but it's not always parsed to where it's always usable. And so this is a really, really good time to assess that. And so I highly recommend you engage with Reverend Stewart. Uh, Reverend Stewart, any closing remarks or comments before we conclude? Uh, none, just thank you again, uh, Dr. Barr to President Johnson and the entirety of the Congress of Christian Education and General Baptist for allowing me to come and share with you on this morning. I pray that you have a blessed day and enjoy the rest of this teaching session. Amen, amen. Thank you all for joining. Next class starts at 1030. Go ahead and take a bio break and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next block of classes. Good afternoon and good morning.